From helping to understand the world, to highlighting the beauty of abstract patterns and logic, math can be pretty rewarding. And sometimes, the rewards of knowing a little math might just be cold, hard cash. Like, say you're offered a 4% annual compound interest rate on a savings account you want to stick $5,000 in. How much money will you have in six years? If you watched the last episode on compound interest, the answer might seem straightforward, but in reality, it depends. And not just between simple and compound interest, but also with time. When it comes to lending and borrowing money, there are a few ways to think of time. Like, we can talk about how much time has passed, or what units of time we're using in the first place. The last two episodes, we've looked at simple and compound interest, and how the latter stacks up a lot faster. But even for compound interest, when the numbers look the same on paper for two different loans, the amount we owe, or the amount we earn, can be different. It all depends on one key detail, the compounding period. And it can make a big difference when it comes to making the most of your money. I'm Jason Guglielmo, and this is Study Hall Real World College Math. You might remember that in finance, there are different types of interest, or the cost that comes along with borrowing or lending money. And last episode, we looked at compound interest, which is a type of interest where the amount of interest is calculated based on all the money currently owed, rather than being the same lump sum each year or month or whatever time period is involved. Like, if you owe 3% compound interest on a loan of $1,000 for two years, you don't just owe $60 on top of the original $1,000. The interest would be $30 the first year, and then 3% of that whole $1,030 the second year, bringing the total interest up to $60.90 by the second year. 90 cents might not seem like much, but the differences quickly add up over time. We saw this with the formula we came up with for these calculations, where we multiply the principal, or the original amount borrowed, by 1 plus the annual interest rate all to the power of the number of years we borrowed the money. It looks fancy, but the formula basically captures how, with compound interest, we multiply the total amount owed by the interest rate year after year. But as it turns out, that's not the whole story. When we worked out that formula, we assumed that for most of the year, the money being owed stays at exactly the same value until at some moment, we suddenly apply the interest. Like, say we borrow $400 with a 3% annual interest rate. Our debt, or the amount we owe, would stay at exactly $400 until exactly one year later when we apply the interest, and suddenly we owe $412. Now, that is how plenty of loans or investments work in real life, but it's not the only way. For instance, we don't have to deal with an annual interest rate, which is a rate that describes how much the interest accumulates as a proportion of the principal over a single year. And even if we are dealing with an annual interest rate, that doesn't mean that it's applied or added to the total amount that's owed exactly once in a year. That sounds confusing, so let me explain. In many cases, the interest rate could actually be applied more frequently, like every quarter or month or even every day. And it gets slightly messier, I mean mathematical, because that doesn't mean the whole annual interest rate gets applied multiple times per year. Instead, the interest might be broken up into smaller chunks. To see how this all shakes out in practice, let's head over to teenagers Alda and Brima, who bought tickets in their town's charity fundraiser raffle. To their surprise, both Alda and Brima win $5,000 each. And they're both in the very privileged situation where neither of them needs the money right now. So they both decide to stick the money in savings accounts so that six years from now, when they're out of college, they have something to put aside for, say, travel or helping with rent if they move to a big city. Alda checks out the offerings at Trefoil Capital, her local bank. They offer a very generous 4% annual compound interest rate for a principal that's around $5,000, like hers. According to their terms and conditions, the interest is applied on an annual basis. So, much like in the previous episode, the balance in her account stays exactly the same all year round except once a year, when she gets an extra 4% added to whatever her current balance is. Alda's pretty clued in on her financial math, and using the same compound interest formula we uncovered last episode, plugs in the numbers to find that on those terms, her bank balance six years from now will be $6,326.60. Subtracting the money she put in in the first place, that means she would earn roughly $1,327. That's enough for a flight to Italy. Brima, meanwhile, finds a similar looking deal at his local bank, Steve Dorr Holdings. Steve Dorr also offers a 4% annual compound interest rate, 
But unlike trefoil, they apply that interest on a monthly basis. The branch assistant explains that although the interest is defined for the year, the interest is calculated in such a way that he gets some interest every month. And that ends up changing what he'll earn. To be clear, he won't get the full 4% interest applied to his balance every month. Instead, like we mentioned before, the key detail is the bank takes the annual rate and divides it up so the interest is spread throughout the year, rather than just showing up all in one day. Since Brima has a 4% annual interest rate that's applied monthly, the bank divides that 4% by the number of months in the year, which is 12, to calculate the interest rate that gets applied. That comes to about 0.33%. Brima's interest gets applied every month, but more generally, the length of time between compound interest payments is called the compounding period. This length of time affects how much you'll have saved after six years. Dividing up an interest rate by some number and applying it more frequently doesn't amount to the same value in the long run. To see what this all means, Brima considers what a shorter compounding period does to the future value of his savings account. First, let's start with our familiar compound interest formula and think about what needs changing. We're no longer using the annual interest rate when applying the interest to the balance. So we need to replace the interest rate in our equation with the interest rate that gets applied each month, which for Brima is 0.33%. Next, we need to change the exponent because the T in our equation stands for the number of years, but now we're calculating the interest each month. Remember, the exponent tells us how many times we're multiplying by or applying the interest rate. So we need to multiply the t in our expression by the number of months in a year, since over the course of a single year, we'll apply the interest rate 12 times. It turns out this new equation will get us a different future value than just applying the annual interest rate every year. We can see this by calculating the future value of Brima's savings account with our new formula. Plugging in the number for six years, he would now earn $6,353.71. Remember, he and Alda were offered the same annual compound interest rate of 4% with the same sized principal of $5,000. But with a shorter compounding period, Rima ends up earning $27 more after six years. He ends up with a larger future value over the same time frame because his interest gets applied more often. And since compound interest applies the interest rate to the principal and all the interest that's been earned so far, all that compounding adds up. And we can use the same kind of reasoning for different compounding periods too. For instance, some short-term loans have daily compounding rates, which can cost the borrower a lot of money over a short period of time. In this case, our formula changes so that the new effective interest rate is adjusted for the number of days in the year, and the exponent is the number of total days, which we get by multiplying t by the number of days in a year. The general pattern emerging here depends on the number of compounding periods in a year, which we call n. And we can use that to stand in for any compound period in our formula. Altogether, this is what we call the compound interest formula. Whatever our compounding period, swap n for the number of times that compounding period happens in the year, and presto, we can work out the future value of a loan or investment depending on the annual interest rate. Now, while this formula is great for calculating the future values of savings and loans with different compounding periods, like we did with Alda and Brima, it would still be handy to have a quick way of comparing which combination of interest rates and compounding periods gives you a better return on your money. After all, potential customers just wanna know if they leave their money in a bank for some period of time which one will give them a better overall return? Let's look at the compound interest formula for a single year. Since we're dealing with only one year, we can go ahead and put t equal to one, which leaves us with a slightly different form of our equation. Then we're going to think about the future value of our account as a proportion of the total money we put in. This is because while different customers might wanna put in different amounts of money, the proportion of that money they get back in interest will be the same, since interest rates are given in percentages of the total balance. We can account for this by dividing both sides of our compound interest formula by the principal amount to give us that proportion we're looking for, and that will cancel out the P on the right-hand side of the equation. On the left side, the proportion we have will be greater than one, since the future value should always be more than the principal. Say we had a loan for $100 that had a final value of $105 after one year that would leave us with a proportion of 1.05. We can subtract one from that proportion to leave us with only the percentage extra we've earned, and since we subtracted one from the left side, we'll do the same to the right to keep the equation balanced. The future value after one year, divided by the principal minus one, 
leaves us with the proportion we've earned in that one year span, which is the magic number we're looking for. And for now, we'll change that to a variable called APY. That gives us a general equation for calculating the percentage of interest we'll earn each year for any annual interest rate and compounding period. Taking the numbers for Trefoil and Steve Dorr, we can plug them into this formula to compare how different compounding periods or interest rates affect our investment. Looking at the two numbers, it's clear that Steve Dorr's savings account gives a higher percentage return in a given year than Trefoil. And assuming the banks are otherwise pretty similar, that makes it the clear winner as a choice for both Alda and Brima. More generally, this formula tells us what percentage of our principal we'll have made on top of our original investment after a single year. But to save that mouthful in a conversation, we call it annual percentage yield, or simply APY. As we saw for our two banks, the concept of APY makes comparing different savings or loans between banks and their competitors more straightforward. That's because, as we saw, the annual interest rate on its own doesn't necessarily tell you which bank account gives you more money in the long run, since we need to account for the compounding period too. APY takes both of those things into account. And the same logic applies for loans too. Except, as you might expect, when borrowing money, we usually want to pick the lowest APY we can. Like 20 years from now, Alda and Brima might be looking to borrow some money to renovate their kitchen. At that point, Trefoil offers loans at a 5.62% interest with a quarterly compounding period, while Steve Dor offers loans at a 5.6% interest compounded daily. Although Steve Dor has a lower annual interest rate, which seems appealing, it might not be the better deal. Using our formula, we actually find that Trefoil is the better option, since it has a lower APY. While comparing two numbers and checking which is smaller is pretty straightforward, the formulas and calculations themselves might take some more practice and familiarizing yourself with before it all falls into place. Wrapping your head around the exact difference between an annual interest rate and an APY might seem tricky at first, and that's totally normal. The key is that the latter does a better job of accounting for the effects of time, both the length and compounding period. But it's not just the period between interest payments that affects the value of our savings or loans. In the real world, we don't always save money by simply throwing a big wad of cash into an account for a long period of time before taking it all out. Instead, we might pay into our savings account regularly or pay off our loans bit by bit. And that's exactly what we'll have a look at next episode. Thanks for watching Study Hall Real World College Math, which is produced by Arizona State University and the Crash Course team at Complexly. If you like this video, give us a like and subscribe. You can learn more about ASU and the videos produced by Crash Course in the links in the description. See you next time.